Good afternoon. Um, for all of us here at the Smithsonian, this has just been an incredible day. In 2019, when we released the first image of a black hole, I didn't think it could get any better or more profound than that. See, I actually remember um, when black holes were purely theoretical. And fast forward over the years, we found out that they sit at the centers of galaxies, they come in multiple sizes. But I would have never imagined that we could image a black hole because all light doesn't escape from a black hole. But the idea, the amazing feat of imaging the event horizon of a black hole, it took advances in technology, it took incredible international teamwork, uh, all kinds of ingenuity and all kinds of perseverance to actually make this happen, not to mention funding from generous funders like the National Science Foundation. So we're here today um, with releasing this image of Sagittarius A star. And I, I think, again, going back to this, this is our black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And to help us understand what we're seeing, how we got this incredible image, we've brought together a group of scientists and engineers from the Center for Astrophysics, which is a partnership between Harvard and the Smithsonian, to help us walk through the results. So let me introduce our panelists. Angelo Ricarte is an astrophysicist who spends his time running and analyzing simulations of black holes, both up close at the event horizon, the point of no return around a black hole, and also on cosmological scales. Angelo and the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, collaboration use images that he creates to learn about black holes from the real data. Carrie Hayworth is an electrical engineer who started her career in satellite design before a long stint programming for the telecommunications industry. She started at CFA designing data processing electronics for the next generation Event Horizon Telescope. She's now the chief technology officer building new technological capabilities and overseeing engineering teams on a variety of exciting projects. Paul Tita is an astrophysicist originally from Canada who explores how supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies behave and whether their properties match predictions from Einstein's theories. Using novel modeling algorithms that Paul develops, the EHT collaboration learns about the structure of black holes in our universe. Shep Dolman is the founding director of EHT and led the international team that made the first image of a black hole. Shep spent a year in Antarctica conducting space science experiments where he got hooked on doing research in challenging circumstances. He now leads uh, the next generation EHT project. Now, while our panelists are talking, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions afterward. So simply type your questions into YouTube, Zoom, or the comment section of Facebook, and we'll answer as many as we have time to get to. But let's get started. Let me hand it over to Angelo. Thanks. So what you're gonna be looking at here is the very first image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And this black hole is called Sagittarius A star, or Sag A star for short. It's got four million times the mass of the sun crammed into a space that would fit inside the orbit of Mercury if we put it where the sun is. And that dark spot in the middle, that's what we call the black hole's shadow, uh, the image of the event horizon or point of no return from which nothing can escape, not even light. The reason we're able to see anything at all is because it's surrounded by the swirling hot gas that is uh, rotating around and into it. And since it's so hot, it's emitting a lot of light. Some of that has uh, traveled all the way to us here on Earth for 25,000 years. And we've collected the radio waves that are being emitted by this hot gas to make the image that you're seeing here today. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk a bit about gravity and black holes in general. So the prevailing theory of gravity is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he conceived of in 1915. It survived over 100 years of tests. He was a pretty smart guy. And uh, his main insight is that gravity doesn't work by there being like invisible strings that are pulling different objects together. 
Instead, the presence of matter causes a warp in space-time, and objects would like to travel in, in straight lines, but they get deflected uh, because of this warp. If you cram enough matter into a small enough space, the gravity becomes so extreme that you create what we call a black hole, an object with an event horizon from which nothing can escape, not even light. These are fascinating and uh, terrifying objects, which is why they're my favorite things to study in the universe and why I have uh, my own little pet black hole. Uh, this guy is named Poe, who uh, usually sits uh, on my desk uh, while I'm working at the CFA. Now, uh, for a long time, uh, black holes were thought to be uh, astrophysical, uh, theoretical objects, uh, but we're now uh, actually able to see them. And as the light is traveling from this hot gas around the black hole, uh, it takes these uh, really bendy paths, as uh, you're able to see in this video here. Now remember, there's this hot gas here, and some of that light gets deflected uh, just a little bit, uh, because the black hole acts kind of like a giant lens, uh, twisting the space-time around it, and so we've got this uh, first magnified image of that hot gas that's there. Uh, but other light rays take more fun and interesting paths, like these, which are taking a full U-turn around the black hole before they're reaching us here on Earth. It turns out if you work out the math on this, complicated general relativistic stuff, uh, the light that is taking this U-turn ends up in a, concentrated in this ring that we call a photon ring. And then other light rays take a full loop-de-loop -loop around the black hole, like these ones. It turns out that these get concentrated into actually an even thinner ring uh, inside of that uh, thin ring that we saw before. What we actually see, we believe, is a stack of an infinite number of thinner and thinner, fainter and fainter rings that are all on top of each other. Uh, something like this, except uh, blurred to the resolution of our telescope, which is uh, limited by our current technology. Now, astronomers over the decades have uncovered two flavors of black hole. There are first uh, these stellar mass black holes, and these are left behind when a massive star blows up in a powerful supernova event, uh, sometimes leaving behind a black hole uh, as its remnant. And these will leave you something that's a few times to a few tens of times the mass of the sun. And then there are the supermassive black holes, which are millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. Uh, those are the only ones that are big enough for us to actually make images of with the Event Horizon Telescope. This is actually the image we released last year of the black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy. And this one's got little streaks that are telling you which way the light is polarized. But overall, uh, this image looks pretty similar to the one that we released today. We've got a donut with a hole in the middle. But uh, despite that similarity, you might not guess that uh, this other black hole is actually over a thousand times more massive and bigger than the other one. Paul will tell us more about why that's so interesting. So overall, black holes really live at the frontier of our current knowledge of uh, physics and astrophysics. Famously, our theories of the very big and the very small have been difficult to put together in a theory of everything. And since black holes kind of live at the boundary of those realms, they can teach us a lot about how we can stitch them together. Also, we think that black holes are important for just our overall uh, cosmic origin story. Because uh, in some galaxies, we see these black holes uh, that are uh, so energetic, they can launch things like these jets that you see here in the galaxy Hercules A. Jets that are spewing out uh, a million light years in either direction that can have profound effects on transforming how the galaxy evolves over billions of years. And so there's a lot that we can learn about black holes by making images, but it's really hard to pull off. Carrie's going to tell us about how exactly we do that. I love that. Re really hard to pull off. Yes, it is very hard to pull off. And I know we have a lot of students watching today. And uh, so I could tell you there were no answers in the back of the book for this one. Um, in fact, we didn't even know if it could be done. And so it took a lot of development of software, a lot of development of hardware, stuff that hadn't even been invented in order to do what we did, which is bring you the, the picture of Sagittarius A star. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the out-of-the-box thinking that was done. Um, first of all, you know, your cell phone takes a certain type of picture, and that's light that you can see. Um, the light that's coming from the black hole is radio light, so we need a special kind of instrument called a radio telescope. And so on the screen, you're about to see a radio telescope. There we go. There's a radio telescope. And so what this does is you see the big mirror on the back of it. So what that mirror does is it allows light to bounce back. 
And so the light is coming in from the black hole. It's hitting this mirror. And the mirror is curved in just a way so it all bounces to one central point. And that central point is where we can image a whatever we're looking at, in this case, a black hole. Now, this particular telescope is from Greenland. It's a very big telescope. If you put six people on top of each other, that's how big this is. It is not big enough by itself to image Sagittarius A star. So how big of a telescope would you need? Well, you would need a telescope that is as big as the Earth. So what we would need to do in order to get this image is to build a telescope really big right on top of the Earth. Well, now you know we didn't do that because one, it's impossible, and two, it would uh, ruin a lot of people's views. So. What did we do? Well, this is where we start getting clever. If you can't put a big telescope on the Earth, what if you turn the Earth into a telescope? So that is the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a virtual telescope. Now, the next slide that's going to be up is kind of showing you how it's done. And so if you, you, know, you kind of have to remember the, the picture that I just showed of the way a radio telescope works. And if you can think of the whole Earth as a radio telescope, the two points that you're seeing, the two radio telescopes on here, are actually two points of the mirror and the light is coming from the black hole, and instead of bouncing back to a central place, we're capturing the light at the radio telescopes, putting on airplanes, and bring it to a central location, and that's where we start to pull out the image. You see the kind of tough words, hydrogen maser clock on there? Well, that's because this takes a whole night of watching this black hole all at the same time. And so we need to make absolute sure that the data that's taken at one telescope on one side of the globe is taken at the exact same time as the other side of the globe, so that when we put the data together, it all makes sense. So let's go back to the globe. Oh, and I did say, you know, we, we captured the light. Well, we captured the light on something like this right here. This is a disk pack, and that's how we capture it. These things go on planes, and then we uh, bring them all together to, to look at all the data. So we're going to go back to the globe, and, you know, it might be hard to see. There's actually little stars on this globe. There's one on the South Pole. That's where our telescopes are. And in fact, there's one I want to show you. This one. I want to show you this one. This is in Hawaii. A lot of people don't know, Smithsonian owns a telescope, and it sits on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's very important of the Event Horizon Telescope. So you may be looking at this saying, well, wait a second, you said, you know, a big, the whole Earth is a telescope, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of mirror points, and that is true. We would love to cover the whole Earth with telescopes, but we can't do that. So what do we do? Well, this is where the software comes in, really good software that allows us to fill in the blanks with the data that we do have and figure out what is there in the places that we don't have yet. So, you know, a lot of work, as I said, hundreds of people need to be working on this. Hundreds of people need to be trying things and building things and thinking of new ways to go forward. And I think it's the most amazing thing in the world, not just to know that there's a black hole at the center of our own galaxy, but also to be able to see it. And Paul's going to tell you a little bit about that. All right, well, so Sagittarius A star is really the culmination of about a half century of research into our galactic center. And what really inspired this was the realization that at the center of every galaxy there exists a supermassive black hole. And while these supermassive black holes and galaxies are everywhere, we know very little about them, not even knowing how they form and barely knowing much about their evolution and how they impact the surrounding environment. So how can we learn about these black holes? Well, just like how we learned a lot about stars by analyzing our own sun, we can learn a lot about supermassive black holes by looking at the one at the center of our galaxy. And this research program really took off in 1974 when radio astronomers first saw a bright, compact radio source at the center of our galaxy, which they then dubbed Sagittarius A star. This kicked off decades of observations where astronomers have tried to better understand the nature of it and zoom in closer and closer. And one of the most exciting discoveries really happened in the mid-90s when two groups started to monitor the motion of stars around the galactic center. And watching the, the motion of these stars for almost three decades, they were able to track them and see that they were orbiting around the center in these beautiful orbits and that the mass contained within them had to be four million times the mass of our sun. And given the compact nature of the central source, the only thing this could really be was a black hole. And now, thanks to the EHT, we have finally zoomed in to the most center region, resolving the black hole and resolving the inner shadow. So how does this image differ from our previous one with M87? Well, they're different in almost every way. 
M87 lives in this giant elliptical galaxy, which is just basically an elliptical blob of stars and doesn't have too many discernible features. On the other hand, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is this beautiful spiral galaxy where we live on one of the outer edges of these spiral arms and the black hole lives in this central bulge-like region. Zooming into the black hole, they're also so different. M87 weighs over six billion times the mass of our sun and is about the size of our entire solar system. Sagittarius A star, on the other hand, is a thousand times smaller. It is a thousand times smaller and is only about the size of the orbit of Mercury. To put this into perspective, if we represent M87 by this 10 pound, um, this 10 pound exercise ball, Sagittarius A star would be about the size of a grain of sand and weigh about a few, the same thing as a few grains of rice. And this massive difference in size is also why our image of Sagittarius A star appears a little more blurry. Because it's so much smaller than M87, matter is able to orbit around it a lot faster. And so for instance, for M87, it takes days to weeks for matter to orbit around it, versus for Sagittarius A star, it take, it's in the order of minutes to hours. And so over the night of an observation, it's not like we're taking an image of this static object that's just staying still. We're taking an image of this image, we're taking an image of this object that is constantly changing. And because of this, our image is kind of a blending of everything, or everything is blurred together. And you know, even given this, I am still struck at how similar these two images are. And this is really a manifestation of Einstein's theory of gravity that says no matter the mass, the size, or what fell into these black holes or what they're composed of, all black holes are fundamentally the same. And in, in physics speak, we often like to say this is because black holes don't have hair. And this is why Angelo's little pet black hole here is bald and has no discernible features except for its cute little eyes. Um, and this just adds to the mystery of black holes and they're really at the center of some of our most open and most profound questions of physics. And now Shep's gonna tell us about what our future goals are with the EHT and black hole science. Okay, well, thanks Paul. Th this has been an incredible day. Uh, we saw this morning our first image of Sagittarius A star, a ring of light that encloses four million times the mass of our sun. There can be no doubt now that we have seen supermassive black holes for the first time. First with M87 a few years ago, and now with Sagittarius A star. It's the dawn of a new era of, of astronomy, really. Precision measurements of black holes on horizon scales. And it happens because of the technique that Kerry shared with us, very long baseline interferometry, pairing telescopes around the globe to make an Earth-sized virtual telescope. And what's more, we're learning from these images. So from M87, for example, we know that there are dynamically important magnetic fields close to the event horizon that cause the radio waves to emit, that cause the black holes to light up. And for Sagittarius A star, we've seen very clearly today that there's dynamism, there's activity close to the black hole that we can study even further. And here at the Smithsonian, we're dedicated to what comes next. So the big question we get whenever we talk you know, to students, to, to anyone really, is what's on the horizon? What are you gonna do next to clarify things? And we're motivated by some key questions in black hole science. So the first one that you'll see represented in this slide is how do we make sense of the dynamical environment around the black hole? You see here a simulation or you know, a, a, you know, in computers for what is happening around the black hole now, this is important because what you've seen so far is the light bending around the event horizon. That's one test of Einstein's theory. But if we could time the orbits of matter as they circularize around the black hole, that would be a completely different test of Einstein's theory. So in the future, we'd like to make movies of what's happening around black holes, specifically so that we can put Einstein to the most stringent tests we can in these extreme laboratories in the cosmos. But more than that, right, which pierces the entire galaxy of M87, if it was the length of a football, and we're going to look at different radio frequencies, adding color to our monochromatic or black and white images that we have so far, the map that you're going to see in a moment shows the current Event Horizon Telescope in blue. Every point here in blue is one that we're actively working with now. And the red points are the places we might put new telescopes to fill in the Earth-sized virtual lens that Carrie was describing. And with this, we'll be able to make the first movies. But first, let me show you a still image 
of the M87 jet that we think that we can recreate with the next generation Event Horizon Telescope. You see here, before it starts moving, you can see the black hole and the faint jet as it accelerates and launches from the black hole. This is the key to understanding how black holes transmit energy down these jets and cause the night sky to look the way it does. Because these jets do influence the way the cosmos looks, at, looks to us. Now, now you'll see it move. If we were able to image M87 every week and stitch these together over a full year, you would see the first movie, time-lapse movie of a black hole. This is incredible. This should knock your socks off. If they're not off, your socks might be on too tightly. But this is showing in near real time the flow of energy from the black hole along the jet. This is what makes the night sky look the way it does. And this is the goal of the next generation of N Horizon Telescope. Now let me tell you what really runs the EHT and the NGHT programs. It's all about people. As I like to say, we're not so much in the science business as we are in the talent business. We want to draw the best and the brightest from all over the globe, united behind a common scientific vision, building technologies and innovating and creating theories and algorithms that allow us to do the work here at the Smithsonian and at our collaborating institutes. Our goal is to sidestep the things that sometimes divide us, borders and politics, and focus on what really matters, global solutions to problems that we thought were impossible. That's what we've done with the Event Horizon Telescope, and that's what we want to continue to do with the next generation EHT. And so now we'd be you know, very happy to answer any questions you have, Ellen. Thanks, Chuck, and that's such a great point. I mean, it, it's, it's to me, you just have to really stop and appreciate what you've achieved here because, you know, again, it's this international team tackling something that within my lifetime, we didn't even know if these things actually existed. And now we've got this image and it's just, it really blows my mind. Now you mentioned the people and how critical they are. And I'd be curious, um, I think a lot of people and one of the questions we've had come in is, you know, is it only astrophysicists who work on this project? And we know that's not true already because we have Carrie, she's an engineer, but can you talk about the kinds of jobs or people that work on black hole research? No, yeah, I, yeah I, could, I could talk about that since I am the person here who's not the astrophysicist. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I should say there, there are so many people. We talk a lot about the scientists because the scientists are bringing us the image. Um, but there are engineers, there are technicians. We have our machinist welding. We have admins making sure that our money's in the right place. We have project, project managers that are trying to make sure everybody's doing the right thing. There are so many different people. Um, and if I could just make a pitch for being an engineer here, it is like being in a candy store. <laughs> it is so much fun. I mean, you get to deal with these astrophysicists. These guys are just a lot of fun. You're solving problems. I mean, as an engineer, you're solving problems is like what I want to do. And they've got the best problems. You know, how do you image a black hole? You know, and, and just other things we work on. You know, how can we find Earth 2.0? There's so many other things that we're looking at. It is just, it's like a candy store of coolness. It really is fun. So yes, I absolutely. People other than astrophysicists, we, we need them. I think that's what we, we don't like to let other people in on, but as somebody who's a planetary scientist, I know for you know, people who study the sun, people who study the universe, working in a team of people with different skills who come from different backgrounds, it's, it's really energizing it and fun. We have all the fun. I hate it to is, break it, it to is people. So much fun. Shep, I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure some people here when, weren't quite getting um, when we said we have to put these on planes and, and fly them around. And I think that's mm -hmm. not how people think of data moving around. You know, in this era, we think of data just moving around the world, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so I think, again, that, that to me, knowing why those things have to be put on a plane and carried is part of the mind-blowing aspect of this whole project. Yeah, sure. So th this is something near and dear to my heart. This is what we call an eight pack. There are eight hard disk drives inside this module. Uh, each one is about 10 terabytes, so about 80 terabytes in here. And what's special about this, uh, leading off of what Kerry was describing with this whole system, is that we freeze the light. This, the EHT only works by recording the light waves at different sites geographically around the globe, and then we store them and we send them back to a central facility where in a large bank of computers, we recreate a global dish, right? But we have to stop the light and freeze it here. And the, 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 the amount of data we'd have to spend back is so large we could never do it on the internet. 
So you can't beat the internet of a 747 filled with hard disk drives. You just can't do that. So we, we load many, many boxes of hard disk drives onto a plane. They fly back. It's the fastest way to get data back from anywhere on the globe. It, it, uh, it's something we have to do, and we've gotten used to it, and it works. Uh, we'd like to be able to do it. I want to add that. We'd like to be we'd able like to not to use have to the airplanes. <laughs> but. Um, I love this question. It's from Perna, Perna who is an as aspiring astrophysicist. She says, can we take the energy of the black hole and use it to power a spaceship to travel to distant places? Paul, what do you think? I would love to try that. Oh. I think that's a really fun idea. <laughs> you know, the hard part's going to be getting to a black hole, but I think mm. black holes themselves are these fantastically powerful engines that, as Angelo has mentioned, like shape the entire galaxy. So there is a lot of energy there to harness. You know, you can put out fun, like, little terms, like you could build a Dyson sphere around the black hole to collect all this energy, <laughs> which would be wild and, you know, centuries or maybe millennia into the future. But that would be fun. Mm. There's also the fact that one of the big things that pa we think powers these jets is the black hole spinning itself. And so you could try to imagine some way to harness into that and use the black hole spinning energy, extract it, and use it to power your spaceships. Because there's unbelievable amounts of energy there. I think that would be pretty cool. That's pretty cool. One of my favorite phrases that I, I heard one time is, no one ever invented anything that someone didn't imagine first. Yeah, and exactly. so the power of imagination. All right, mm. this is from Karen on YouTube. How will this black hole image be useful for astronomy? So uh, Angela, how do you, you know, what do you, okay, this is an amazing image, it's really cool. What are you gonna do with it? Yeah, um, so th when imaging black holes, um, we're at the intersection of a whole bunch of different subfields. Uh, there's all the complications of actually getting the image but when you have the image, we still need to uh, think about the theories of gravity, accretion and feedback, that is uh, how matter is flo flowing in and getting flung out of the system, and also plasma physics, uh, how the ions and electrons that make up the gas are actually behaving in detail. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we don't really understand fully uh, in this really extreme environment that uh, only the EHT is able to give us access to. And uh, for one, as one example, um, so one of the interesting things that we've noticed in our models is that uh, we tend to have uh, more variability in, in our simulations of the uh, accretion flow than we actually observed in, uh, in Sagittarius A star. And so this is already giving us uh, some new insights into uh, maybe different ways that we can improve our, our models, new physics that, that we can include. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, these new observations are really pushing the theory. Very cool. Um, Shauna wants to know, would we see anything change if we took another image of Sagittarius A star while it was snacking on a new gas cloud? Paul, do you want to take okay. that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, actually, it's kind of interesting um, because a new gas cloud Sagittarius A star is not this uh, static beast, and around once a day, we actually see these giant eruption events that cause the black hole to brighten greatly and kind of shift in its center of light. And, and one of the things we think that's actually happening is these magnetic fields break, and it's dumping a bunch of energy. So you say a new gas cloud, well, it's kind of like the black hole or the accretion disk is forming a new ball of uh, hot matter. And if you watch this while we make an image, what you'll actually see is it whip around the black hole and kind of orbit around it. And there's a bunch of really interesting um, physics that goes into this and that can be extracted that we can use to like learn more about the black hole and really get after um, the nature of like space time and gravity in, in these extreme situations. Cool. Mm -hmm. So students from DC Oaks High School in Castle Rock, Colorado, want to know what kind of education is required to become part of a team like this. And Carrie, that goes, that goes to all of you, but it, it goes back to you with these, are, these people aren't all astrophysicists. Right, and so, you know, I, I would say that, that, first of all, do what you love, because, you know, that's, that's going to get you, make you successful. But, you know, an engineering degree will help. Um, being, you know, getting a machinist certification would help because we need machinists. Um, you know, getting a PhD in astrophysics, 
Okay. It also helps a little bit, <laughs> um, but it really it really depends on how you want to help. And so you know, do what you're really good at, and and you can find a way here because there's plenty of opportunities. And a lot of people who do coding, right? So because uh, it's a ton mm -hmm. of software for this. So oh yeah, and if I could just push, we are hiring right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, software, <laughs> software engineers, we we absolutely need them. I talked about how difficult the software is, and yes, we we absolutely need them. So anyone who's interested in the software out there, absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, we we need a lot of those. So. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important for us to, to remind everybody um, the Event Horizon Telescope is a, is a collaboration of institutions, not just here in the United States, but mm -hmm. from around the world. So, so there are opportunities to get involved, not just here, but all over. So from Remington, do you think that black holes lead to other universes? And if so, do you think that it is possible for someday for us to get to those universes? Uh, so Chef, I, I'm going to yeah, send that to I'll, you. I'll take that one. Having come from a different universe. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll take that one. So, so, so th there are different constructs called wormholes. And the theory about a wormhole is that some people think you can travel through a wormhole to a distant part of the galaxy or a different part of the universe. And one of the things I'll say about that is that wormholes would give you a different kind of shadow. So you can think about what we've seen with the Event Horizon Telescope. And you can think, what if we were looking at a wormhole? that was a little bit different from the standard black hole that we think we're imaging. And the answer is that the shadow would be a little bit smaller or it could be different in shape. And so we're sensitive to these kinds of things. And as our focus sharpens on black holes, as we make better and better images and start to look at the dynamics of the, of the black holes, then we'll be able to differentiate between what we think is a true black hole and potentially some kind of a wormhole. So it's an open question. Uh, we might be able to observe it in the future. We don't know until we build the next generation instrument but it's a, really, it's a really cool thing to think about. So Mary Beth and Matthias want to know, is it accurate that there are millions of black holes in our galaxy, but only one at the center? Angelo, I'm gonna give that to you. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, we think that there are both the uh, stellar mass black holes and the uh, supermassive black holes. So we do think that there are millions of black holes in the galaxy. These would be the stellar mass variety. Just uh, from the normal processes of stellar evolution, some small percentage of those stars are going to be massive enough to blow up and leave behind a black hole uh, that'll be uh, roaming around the galaxy somewhere. Usually we're not lucky enough to actually be able to detect them. Uh, sometimes we do via uh, the fact that they have a nearby other star that's feeding it gas so that it lights up with an accretion disk. Uh, recently we've also been able to detect uh, gravitational waves from uh, black holes that have merged together. Um, and uh, there may also actually be uh, wandering intermediate to supermassive black holes as well. These are actually predicted uh, just by how galaxies form. Um, galaxies form uh, from the uh, collisions of uh, many other smaller galaxies. And so uh, there may be, uh, we, we think that around the Milky Way, there may be uh, around 10-ish uh, in this intermediate to supermassive range wandering around as well. Uh, and then does every galaxy have a black hole? We believe so, at, at least if the galaxy is uh, uh, as big as the Milky Way or bigger. We're not sure yet about the uh, dwarf galaxy regime. Uh, so these would be things like the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, the Magellanic Clouds. These tend to have uh, less uh, defined structure. Uh, usually you find these supermassive black holes uh, at, the, at the cores of these galaxies where there's a bulge. Oftentimes there isn't one. Not sure where to look. And also we'd expect them to be smaller and uh, more difficult to find. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, both of those uh, aspects of those questions were really kind of at the cutting edge. Uh, yeah, things that we of don't, what we know. Not, yeah, yeah, still figuring things out. Well, and th this is what makes this field so exciting because every time you learn something, it, the questions just get more complex and there's more to go figure out. Mm -hmm. So this gets to, I think, a lot of people's confusion. All right, uh, and this is from Kyron. If, if light cannot escape from a black hole, how did we take a picture of it again? Paul. That's, that's, a, that's a great question, and I think everyone has this view in their mind that these black holes just suck everything in and nothing can escape. But as I think Angelo and Shep have mentioned, we do see these things escape. And what we're actually seeing when we look at a black hole isn't the black hole emitting light. We're looking at the matter and the hot gas around it emitting light. And, and so because of this, this light escapes to our eye, but there is a part or an inner part of the shadow where no, very little light actually comes to our eye. And this is where you see this, um, see this depression. Image? Yeah, can we pop the image up one more time just to cause trouble here? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so what we're seeing in this image is actually this bright region is this hot gas. So this hot gas emits quite a bit of light, or at least quite a bit of light relative to other things in the vicinity. And so you'll see this bright ring. And what, what happens is, is, is this light is bent. There becomes a point where it gets so close to the black hole that the black hole, most of the light just tips in and goes into the event horizon, forming this little shadow-like shadow, shadow -like region. But so you know, we say we're making an image of a black hole, but maybe the more accurate thing is to say we're making an image of the matter around the black hole, and then the black hole is casting a shadow on what we see. But I think what's so exciting and intriguing for me is, is the idea, because I always had this very simplistic view that it would just be totally black, but this idea that you have these energetic processes that are taking place right at, at that event horizon, I just think is really cool because then all of a sudden that's where all the cool physics is, yeah. right? It, that, that we probably don't totally understand. Yeah, these, these are really the most powerful objects in the universe. These things give off the most powerful energy. We can detect light that's gamma ray levels, so much light that an individual photon can have as, as much energy that if you dropped a P from this table and it hit a ground, one individual photon could have as much energy of that. So you can imagine, you could feel that if we could. It's, these things give off unbelievable amounts of energy. And they're really mm. behemoths, but they're, they're, they're quite magical. They are. Magical. Can I add to that, Ellen? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, when we ask about why black holes can emit the way they do, it, here's an example that, that I come back to occasionally. If I dropped an apple from my outstretched hand, that would release about a joule of energy. And that's enough to power your cell phone for about a second, okay? So, and then the reason you don't get more than that is because the Earth has a surface. So the Earth is pulling down, but it stops here, releases that amount of energy. But if you took the mass of the Earth and condensed it into like an inch across, it would be a black hole. S same mass as the Earth, but just a different configuration of matter. Then if you were to drop the apple from the same height, it would have so much energy when it reached the bottom that it would be able to power Manhattan for an entire year. So that's the difference. Same mass, but just different configuration. That's why black holes are so magical. Just by changing how you scrunch the matter together, they become the most efficient engines in the universe for turning falling matter into luminosity. And how that matter gets squunched down really small, just crazy, all right? Armando wants to know, what are the brighter spots in the image of Sagittarius A star. Um, and, and I guess this is where, to me, it's also hard to get. The image we're looking at is actually a composite of a lot of images. So maybe you could talk about okay, that. Yeah. OK, yeah, so there is three bright spots on this image. And um, I think this is really because we're taking a composite of a whole bunch of different images. This, this image is quite uncertain. We don't really know the angular structure of it that well due to it being so variable. And so I think um, if, if you look at all the potential images that we can make that of this black hole, you'll actually see this brightness region shift around quite a bit. So it won't always be in these three spots. So I think these, these three spots is kind of more of an artifact of us stacking a whole bunch of these different configurations together. But it, it, doesn't necess it could just be a bit of an artifact of that. Mm -hmm. not, Sagittarius A star has three knots of emission. So, Angela, we shouldn't look at the image of M87 and, and Sagittarius A star and read too much into the configuration of variations in brightness in the donut, in other words. Yeah, that's right. Well, in the case of M87, uh, because we're more uh, confident in its structure since it was not moving so much, uh, we do interpret the uh, asymmetry in the image to uh, Doppler beaming. This is a uh, uh, weird uh, general relativistic effect where stuff that is moving towards you actually gets brighter, uh, which only happens when stuff is moving near the speed of light. In the case of Sagittarius A star, uh, things are more uncertain due to the fact that the stuff is moving around more rapidly. But it is possible to get structures like that naturally. Uh, in the simulations that you saw, uh, that Shep showed us earlier, you could see some streams uh, moving around. If you blurred that, sometimes you would see something that would like, look like three knots. Um, but that yeah, isn't necessarily uh, uh, as reliable due to the imaging or as meaningful in the case of uh, M87. Okay. okay, this is from Harold. He wants to know, will the James Webb Space Telescope be used by the EHT project? Uh, 
Oh, this is an interesting one. Um, Go. Do, well, you know, it, it, this is an interesting one because of the fact that we are, we're limited right now. The, the Event Horizon Telescope is limited by the size of the Earth. Right, and so we can't we can't get any better than the size of the Earth because our telescopes are on the Earth. But what if we put a telescope in space? Well, now we're making a bigger virtual telescope, which means that we can, you know, see more fine details, which which would be amazing. Um, we have not put, we, you know, you would need to be a radio telescope on the James Webb, and it would have to be, you know, at the frequencies that we have. So James Webb was not built for that. Um, so we can't use James Webb, but but it would be an exciting thing to put a telescope out. Um, maybe there's a, a better way of saying some sort of multi-wavelength kind of project that, that we could use it, kind of use the, use the EHT alongside James Webb, so why don't you? Oh, me? Okay, yeah. What, what are you? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think um, using, we wouldn't use the James Webb telescope to help us make the image, but we would use the James Webb telescope to, as an aid while we image Sagittarius A star or M87 to kind of look at it in a, in a different in a different light and i say light on purpose because we, we will literally be seeing it in a very different wavelength than we will so all the emission processes the look of the black hole what's happening will look very different and this can help us learn a lot about some of the stuff angelo is really interested in the accretion flow and about what really is happening around there that's cool I, i'm already thinking we could sit here and purpose design this mission that would you know where would we put it? Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're, we're working on that we're now. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I have to say that, you know, Carrie and I and others are, are involved now in thinking about what orbit we would put a satellite in. That's what you I know, was Do we keep it in low Earth orbit so that it makes many orbits, you know, every day and mm -hmm. sweeps out a lot of the Earth-sized virtual lens? If we put it at an uh, elliptical orbit so it goes far away, gives us high angular resolution, and then comes, comes back, back down where we can offload data from the satellite, it's a whole different game, yeah. a whole different way of looking at how to study black holes. Yeah, each orbit gives you something. Yeah, something gives you something. Yeah. If, you're if you're starting to design it in your head. Yeah, it's I was. <laughs> so, I'm. Okay, from Shivati, he wonders, in the future, what's the plan for studying inside the event horizon? Wow. Well, I, I can just say a couple of words about that. Uh, it is probably impossible for us to see inside of a black hole. Right. So the, the idea is that once you cross the event horizon, there's no physical way that we know of to come back out from there. Now, that's not to say we can't learn something about what is going on inside the black hole from observations outside. And there are some theories, again, getting back to what, what Angela was saying, that quantum mechanics and gravity have to combine at the interior of the black hole. So you could get potentially some quantum mechanical you know, effects that could leak out from the event horizon itself, and that might affect the emission coming from outside the black hole. And as we heard from Paul, that's what, we're, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the light coming from hot gas outside of the black hole. So it's possible in the future we might be able to address this question of what happens inside a black hole. But short of going in and throwing somebody into the event horizon, I don't see that happening in the next week or so. Yeah, OK. So from Michael on YouTube, um, can you tell us what the next target or targets is? Uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one too. So we're always thinking about what we're going to look at next. Uh, M87 and Sag Star were our primary targets. They're the biggest supermassive black holes on the night sky. But there are other galaxies, uh, you know, M31, the Sombrero Galaxy, uh, Centaurus A. There are other things we would like to look at where we can see the innermost launchings of these jets. And there may even be sources out there that we haven't seen yet that we will uncover through surveys using other telescopes, like the James Webb Telescope. And we might see something interesting follow up on that with the Event Horizon Telescope and see a very, very massive black hole that we didn't even know existed before. So we're always on the hunt for new targets. OK. This is a really interesting question. I can, I can see where this comes in. Okay, From Liz in Georgia, she said, if a black hole sucks in matter surrounding it, does it have a whirlpool effect on the galaxy? And I think she's thinking of that video you showed where the, the stars were circling around the black hole and it's sucking in material. And she said, okay, if that is happening, um, how can the universe be expanding given all the black hole whirlpool effects that would be taking place in the universe? So Angela, you wanna? Yeah, uh, so it's a common misconception that black holes actually suck in everything around them. Uh, they actually, uh, as long as you're far enough away from it, 
act like uh, just any other um, object that would have the same amount of mass. Uh, so Paul showed earlier uh, this video made by the UCLA group of these stars uh, orbiting around the black hole. Uh, they're not actually getting sucked into it. They're able to complete these orbits. Um, and because of that, um, so the black hole actually doesn't have this kind of whirlpool effect of like stars in the galaxy going down it uh, into a drain. Uh, in addition, compared to the galaxy as a whole, uh, the black hole uh, only dominates the gravitational potential field in a relatively small region. Uh, only a few uh, tens of light years, I believe, uh, whereas the uh, galaxy itself is uh, something like 100,000 uh, light years across. Um, and so, uh, yeah, sometimes this makes uh, these black holes actually pretty difficult to find. And uh, we're only able to locate the one at the center of our galaxy uh, because it is uh, so relatively nearby compared to, to other galaxies. And we can watch the stars uh, move around and complete their orbits. So Shep, obviously you've been in, on this project you know, from the beginning. So Heather on YouTube um, wants to know, is the image of the black hole what you expected? And I want you to answer that from the perspective of M87. And then maybe Angela, you can take, is, is this one any different? Because now we had this, this image of Sagittarius A star. Is it different from what you expected knowing about M87? Um, and if, if, if it's not, how different is, is it than you, you thought it would be? So Shep, I'll start with you, that very first image of the black hole. Yeah, th so w what was it what we expected? Well, there are two levels on which to answer that, really. One is the emotional level, and one is the scientific level. You know, seeing the first image of a black hole three years ago was, was just mind-boggling. It was a mixture of awe, humility, uh, wonder that we've been able to do this. Uh, and, and just the, the ability, as you said before, Ellen, to do it as part of a team. The, the scientifically, M87 is a curious case because we didn't know quite what the mass of the black hole was. There were two different estimates of the mass, one coming from stars moving around the black hole and one from gas orbiting the black hole. We didn't know which was correct. When we saw the ring of light, we knew immediately which one was correct. So it helped us immediately understand the context of other studies that had been made of, of M87. So it was what we expected, but we also learned something from it immediately when we saw that first image. Um, so in terms of what I expected, uh, if you asked, uh, say, uh, maybe five years ago, Angelo, um, well, uh, my expectation was that this was going to be so hard that it might not even be possible. So uh, I, my first impression when I saw this was, wow, my, my colleagues actually pulled this up <laughs> and dealt with all this uh, time variability. Um, now, compared to M87, um, one thing I wasn't expecting is that it would be so symmetrical. Um, this is uh, indicative uh, of the fact that uh, it seems like uh, our models prefer this, uh, the, our view of this black hole to also be kind of pull on the same way it is for, uh, for M87, um, which is maybe not your first guess because we're living in this uh, uh, disk of a galaxy and uh, you, you might expect if uh, the black hole would align with that, uh, that uh, it would be uh, kind of uh, with an edge-on configuration, the way that we're seeing it. Um, but instead, we have another pull-on view. Uh, it's kind of annoying. It would have been nice to have two views, <laughs> two different angles. Or maybe the next time we, we look at it, it'll look different. Um, okay. yeah. So from Marie, has the EHT imaged a regular star that has been imaged with other telescopes to serve as a baseline of what a star would look like compared to Sagittarius A star? So I'm wondering, you know, you use, we can look at objects all, with radio, you know, we can look at different wavelengths to look at different objects. So I, I guess she seems to be curious about how a regular star looks like in radio data as opposed to a, um, I think oh, that's the question. Okay, I, I was taking hole. it in a slightly different direction. Okay, go on, go um, I, I thought maybe what was, oops, it's gone. Uh, I was thinking that <laughs> what was meant was have we looked at other sources where we know the structure would be a little bit different so that we have some confidence that when we look at it for a ring, we see a ring. When we look for something that's not a ring, we don't see a ring. Mm -hmm. and, and the quick answer to this is that we did look at calibrator sources. So we looked at other radio galaxies on the sky where we don't expect to see a ring, where we expect to see that jet structure only because they're so far away, we can only see the jet. 
And in a number of cases, in three or four cases so far, we've seen that expected jet structure. It's a very powerful indication that our imaging is robust. And then when we see an object where we think there's going to be a ring, we see rings. But when we don't expect to see a ring, then we see the expected jet structure. So it's very powerful confirmation. Um, Paul, I'm going to ask you this from Mary Beth. Are black holes a form of dark matter? Oh, that's a great Ooh. question, actually. <laughs> OK, so this, is, this, is, uh, this goes pretty deep. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right? So, so I, people don't really know what dark matter is. We, we have a bunch of different theories, whether you want to go axions, wimps. And actually, early on, and even today somewhat still, certain people believe that a part of dark matter is composed of black holes. Now, these black holes that we're thinking of are, I think, the, the current understanding is that they're probably primordial black holes that formed very early on in the universe and are kind of spread out around it. But I think the understanding is that it's a fraction of it, and there's still some other unexplained fraction that can't just be. It can't be that all of dark matter are black holes. There's a maybe a chance that part of it is our black holes, but then another part of it has to be either another form of matter or maybe even uh, a tweak to our theory of gravity. Wow, I didn't know that, all right. From YouTube, do you know why Sagittarius A star looks stretched compared to M87? I'm not sure what stretched means, maybe you guys do. And how did you overcome former visual limitations like the quasar and dust? Anybody so, get you that want me one? To, well, well, so I'll, I'll take a crack at this. Um, so there's a lot of challenges to imaging Sagittarius A star. One, you hinted at, Ellen, uh, there's ionized gas between us and the galactic center, so that causes a blurring effect, so we had to overcome that. Um, Sagittarius A star, of course, is moving, so we had to overcome that. Um, and because of these extra added noise contributions, the fact that it's blurry, the fact that it's moving, the, the ring may look a little bit irregular and stretched, is I think the question. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably just an artifact of us seeing one moment in the life of Sagittarius A star and trying to overcome this noise. If we looked at it at a different time, it might be stretched in a slightly different direction or might have the brightness around the ring in different locations. So that's why we want to observe it more and more and with higher and higher definition. That's awesome. Okay, from Paul, is our black hole spinning and how mm. fast? Angela. Why are you in the comments section? I don't know. I was going to have my yeah, phone yeah. out, I think, in here. In I'm a, asking the hard ones. I, know, I like how you said our black hole. That's um, nice. So yeah, in general, black holes, we believe, uh, do have some amount of spin. It's been a longstanding mystery in terms of uh, how quickly they are rotating compared to their uh, theoretical maximum limit. Uh, so at the moment, we've uh, done a bunch of simulations to make uh, uh, simulated images of uh, black holes that have different amounts of spin. And so far, it seems like uh, uh, the image prefers uh, models where the black hole is spinning substantially. Uh, at the moment, this is indirect, uh, just based on, uh, uh, well, things like uh, uh, image size and the width of these rings. Um, but there, there isn't uh, something, uh, there isn't uh, a, a smoking gun inside of that image somewhere that tells you what the spin is. Uh, so we'd like to continue uh, analyzing uh, this object. Uh, there are still more and more observations and data that will uh, give us uh, a better insight into the spin as well. Will the next generation Event Horizon Telescope help with that? Yeah, I, I, I really think that it will. One of the goals of the next generation EHD is to see that first inner ring that Angela was talking about. So there's the Tufty emission which comes from light that is gently lensed around the black hole. And there's that first inner ring that makes uh, a U-turn around the black hole. And that's very tightly defined. That's a really good test of spin. So if we could measure the ratio or the difference between the lightly bent photons and the ones that make a U-turn, that would help us disentangle spin from our images. That almost sounds like hair. Um, okay, so from... It's from one hair. One <laughs> hair. Yeah. Black holes have two hairs. <laughs> Massive spin. From um, Abed, and I want to apologize to anybody who where I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, why are the jets only coming from the poles of a black hole, not elsewhere, since the black hole is a three-dimensional object? 
do we know they're only coming from the poles of a black hole? We suspect. Yeah. Angelo, suspect. did you want to yeah. answer um, So, yeah, even though a uh, black hole is a 3D sphere, um, there are some preferred directions. Uh, so one is uh, the fact that the black hole is spinning, and so uh, this gives you an axis of rotation, and uh, you'll tend to uh, extract spin energy from the black hole uh, and launch uh, along that spin axis. Uh, and then there's also the uh, uh, axis that's defined by the uh, rotation of the gas around it, which doesn't necessarily have to align with that of the black hole, and uh, that's a different axis. Um, uh, at the moment, we're actually not sure in general um, which one a jet is going to align with and on which scales. It probably depends, um, but uh, this gives you some directions uh, that gas will preferentially try to escape from. Okay, this is a great question from Yash. Do black holes collapse? And if so, is there a way to find out when and how? So I think of them as already being collapsed, but could they collapse more? Um, no. So, no. so the, the, the edge of the, this is, it's a really good question. Um, so when black holes form, we define it as there being an event horizon. And the, this, this surface is really defined as the point where light can no longer escape. So even if whatever caused the black hole starts collapsing more and more, at least to us as an outside observer, the event horizon looks the same. Mm -hmm. We can't actually see what's happening past it. It's one of the really big mysteries of what happens inside a black hole. And we can never know because this event horizon like, just shields it from us. You can never see it. It's just really interesting. You know, another way to, to, to think about that too is that the event horizon is not part of the black hole. The black hole is this singularity. The black hole is in a point of infinite density and, and a certain amount of mass that's at the center. And the event horizon is just this mathematical membrane that exists around it. Now it's important because once you cross through there, you can't come back out. And this is, this is, this is interesting because for a stellar mass black hole, if you were to fall through the event horizon, you would be ripped to shreds. At, when you went through the event horizon, you'd be spaghettified. Your feet would be ripped off your body. Your head would be left far behind. It's not a vacation, right? <laughs> no, but no, for, for, for M87, it's so big, and the event horizon is so far from that little tiny dot in the center that you could drift through and not even know you were going through the event horizon. Right? So different black holes have different curvature at their edges, which determine whether you'll be shredded or not shredded. But it's not part of the black hole itself. From Mukesh, um, and I'm afraid this is going to be our final question. From Mukesh, why is the image of a black hole a donut shape and not spherical? Because they're delicious. Mm -hmm. I love donuts. <laughs> <laughs> My guilty pleasure. It shows something fundamental about the donut, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can take it, I guess. Okay, yeah, um, go ahead. So in, in the animation that we showed earlier, um, there's a property of the space-time around a black hole where it's going to actually try and uh, put... Uh, light that reaches us into this thin and narrow ring. Um, and so a part of the answer to this is because that is what a black hole kind of forces the light to do. Um, another part of the answer to this is because uh, there isn't so much uh, material there that uh, uh, you have a lot of obscuration. So uh, if there was uh, a lot more material in the way, uh, then you would kind of obscure that ring structure and you would end up with more of a blob or maybe an elongated uh, jet or accretion disk looking thing, uh, which happens to be not the case for the black holes we've imaged, just because of uh, how uh, efficiently they're currently eating. Very cool. And I'm afraid we're out of time, but I really want to thank Angelo, Carrie, Paul, and Shep for helping us walk through this just really historic and amazing day of the return of this image of Sagittarius A-star by the Event Horizon Telescope. Thank you so much for joining us here today. <laughs>